thank you for 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 joining me this morning. Um, I'm excited to give my first Zoom Graham rounds. The case that I have today, uh, it's a really interesting case that I think really asks a lot of questions and uh, gives a good scaffold for us to talk about how to approach our emergent and urgent surgical patients given uh, the coronavirus and the sort of steps that we need to do to ensure our own safety as well as our patient safety. Uh, let me see. So briefly, um, we'll go through this patient. I I'm gonna make the talk about the patient itself uh, probably a little bit more uh, uh, abbreviated than we typically do for the growing rounds, just because I have, I think, some valuable stuff to talk about um, regarding protocols here at Keck. He is a 60-year-old gentleman, uh, very well known to our service. He has bilateral thyroid eye disease, first plugged in with us last September, um, marked bilateral proptosis. Um, at the current moment, he is currently monocular in his right eye only, still with significant proptosis, exposure keratopathy, uh, and he has this persistent corneal ulcer that's now uh, super infected uh, with uh, Canada that we're trying to treat and trying to get him into the OR quickly. Um, for the sake of completeness, I'll go through the rest of his past medical history. The review of systems is negative. Uh, past ocular history, he has an idiopathic anterior uveitis in the left eye, thought to be herpetic in nature. Uh, he's got hyperthyroidism, hepatitis B, as well as hypertension. This is really the meat and potatoes of this slide right here. I'd mentioned to you that he came to us first in September, very uh, proptotic on both sides. Um, the left side, unfortunately, which was worse than the right, he um, had a corneal perforation from his exposure in October of last year. Uh, our cornea service took excellent care of him and did an emergent uh, full thickness transplant early November of last year. And then Dr. Zhang Nunes and I took him to the operating room in uh, December of last year for an urgent decompression just to save that full thickness graft because that too um, had problems with exposure given his proptosis. Uh, kind of run through his medications, uh, his social history, his family history, and his allergies, all uh, more or less non-contributory towards uh, the talk at hand today. Um, but really, key points to take away from the slide is that he's had a full thickness transplant in that left eye. His vision in that left eye now is 2400. The right eye is his good eye. Vision's 2050, except he's suffering from exposure care top of the internet right eye now. So this is him when he first uh, plugged into our clinic October of last year. You can see the upper eyelid retraction, the lateral flare, the inferior scleral show there on the left. Uh, he's got some conjunctival injection and the caruncle is a little inflamed, pretty characteristic of uh, thyroid eye disease that's, that's starting to burn out, that's not active at the moment. Here you have the worm's eye view. You can see that left eye markedly proptotic. Uh, you can see looking at the corneal light reflex that he certainly has a, a worse ocular surface there on the left as compared to the right. Um, because of that exposure, he developed an ulcer there on that left side. Like I mentioned earlier, the cornea service did an excellent job taking care of him, put in that full thickness transplant in November of last year. Um, for a brief teaching moment, because I don't want this all to be about protocols and guidelines, I do want to mention briefly our technique for a temporary tarsorophy. Um, in between the time when he had that full fitness transplant there on the left, and before we took him for his urgent decompression there on the left, we needed to ensure the safety of that graft. So the way our oculoplastic service uh, puts in our temporary tarsorophy is that we make sort of a functional tarsorophy using IV tubing. You can see that outlined there in the red. Uh, we cut it down to size, and then we use a 4-0 proline suture um, to secure those bolsters to the eyelid margin. We pass those sutures through the tarsal plates so that we have good structure. And the cool thing about this kind of temporary tarsorophy, as you can see here uh, by the video, is that you can open and close it so that you can manage and take a look at that ocular see, surface right here. Um, as it is healing. You can apply drops mm -hmm. if needed. You can check on the health of that graft, all the while keeping those eyelids closed uh, until you want to open them up at a later date. So, there we go. So this was him in January of this year. You can see a market reduction in the proptosis there on the left, uh, really excellent result. He didn't have any problems with exposure after that decompression. We didn't have to put in a tarsorophy. He was planned to go for an urgent decompression on the right because he was starting to develop ocular surface disease, but due to insurance issues, uh, he was lost to follow up for us for about eight weeks on the right side. And unfortunately, he... Um, briefly, let me give a, a quick... Uh, uh, contrast between pre-op and post-op photos there. This just really highlights the um, amount of uh, uh, 
apoptosis reduction there on the left side that we achieved with that surgery. Um, so here we are, uh, the right side is now significantly proptotic, developing problems with exposure, and he develops this recurrent corneal ulcer there on the right with a superimposed infection with uh, Canada for which he's currently being treated, and for which I put in uh, a temporary tarsal fee similar to the one that you just saw on the right eye last week. So the issue is his right eye is his good eye right now that is currently closed with that temporary tarsal fee. And we are trying to get him into the operating room for an urgent decompression there on that right side uh, so that that right eye doesn't undergo the same unfortunate circumstances that the left eye did. Now, <clears throat> let's take a, a few steps back. And, um, you know, unless you're living under a rock right now, it doesn't matter where you're getting your news from, but you're, you're, you're aware that, you know, we're living in a different world than we were back in November. Uh, with the coronavirus and with all of its implications, we are now dealing with a significant amount of uh, new protocols and guidelines, uh, new safety measures that we have to ensure for these patients that need to go to the operating room. So I thought this pace in, in particular uh, lent itself well to talking about some of those shifts. Um, briefly, quick review, I'm sure you all know this right now, but just to talk about what we're dealing with, this article came out in the New England Journal, I think on the 17th of this year, um, described this new uh, novel SARS coronavirus, tells us that this virus is viable, uh, it's transmissible in the air in an unventilated room up to three hours after uh, particles have been aerosolized. It's viable up to four hours on copper surfaces, it's viable up to 24 hours on cardboard, and it's viable up to two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. So all this slide, what, the point I'm trying to get across from this slide is that not only is this virus uh, highly transmissible through the air, but also as people aerosolize virus particles, it can lay out on surfaces and then uh, become a contact transmission issue uh, from fomites. The University of Nebraska last week published this paper where they went into the ISO rooms of 13 patients with the SARS coronavirus 2 and they swabbed the entire patient room looking where they may find virus particles and they found it everywhere. They found it on the toilets, they found it on the sinks, they found it on the window sills, and they also found it in the ambient air. So this is just to give us perspective of um, the virus itself and how it's uh, transmitted and the things that we need to take precautions for. We are ophthalmologists. You know, I think we're taking appropriate measures. Many of our slit lamps now have those plexiglass shields protecting us from the patient. So we know as far as aerosolized uh, products go, we're at least uh, slightly more safe from that. But what about uh, manual manipulation of the ocular surface during exam? What kind of uh, uh, transmissibility can I expect to find from that? Well, this paper was published uh, about four days, or this paper was, was, was uh, submitted to AAO four days ago. It hasn't undergone the peer reviewed process, but given the coronavirus, it was uh, put online. A group from Duke in conjunction with uh, healthcare workers in Singapore wanted to look at the transmissibility of uh, the new novel coronavirus through tears. So they collected tear samples from 17 patients that were coronavirus positive. Um, between days three and day 20 from the initial onset of symptoms. Uh, they collected these tears using a Shermer strip, uh, then placed the Shermer strips in transport media, then to take them to the lab for evaluation. And at the same time as they were collecting those tears, they were also performing nasopharyngeal swabs um, that are really the gold standard for, for, for assessing uh, the virus and uh, someone's infectivity. So really for, for treatment manages, management, they were only looking at the NP swabs and then the researchers also in addition got these uh, tear collections uh, to take to the lab to see if there was any correlation between the nasopharyngeal uh, uh, infectivity or virus found on those NP swabs as compared to tears. Um, so they collected a total of 64 samples as I mentioned previously. Um, and the researchers found that neither a viral culture or uh, the reverse transcriptase PCR uh, showed virus in the tears, uh, which I think is, you know, at least a little bit reassuring for us as providers to know that at least in these patients, they weren't able to find infectious virus uh, transmissible through the tears. I should also note that, you know, we're being told that in a certain subset of these patients, they can present with a conjunctivitis, 
there was only one patient in the study who did develop conjunctival injection of chemosis during the study. So perhaps the results may have been different if they only looked at 17 patients that had uh, coronavirus, uh, that were coronavirus positive also with conjunctivitis. But I think the take home message here, message here is that <clears throat> at least from this study, the teeters seem not to be as a highly uh, a problematic transmission route as other media. When we're operating, there are certainly conditions <clears throat> and procedures in the operating room that lend itself well to aerosolizing uh, products and, and, and increasing the risk of our providers. There was a study from 1994, it's up on the CDC's website, <clears throat> that looked at various surgeries from different subspecialties, uh, measuring different particle sizes that were released into the air as aerosols during those surgeries. And not surprisingly, power tools, things like a drill, uh, things like a, like a burr, like a microdebreeder, produce the highest levels of aerosols in the air. But surprisingly, the, the techniques that generated the most aerosols outside of the sterile zones that's outside within, I think, about five feet of the patient and people who are, are dressed in ground appropriately were really the CO, were, were, were laser scalpels, electroscalpels, and the electrocautery. And so I mentioned this slide just for those providers, and I realize this is, this is more pertinent to Dr. Zane Nunes and I, but who do use these procedures um, because these do uh, cause increased aerosols to be sprayed throughout the operating room environment. And I think we should all be cognizant of that uh, during this time period. So I, you know, I've talked about the virus a little bit, sort of what we're dealing with and um, some of the risks that we see here in the operating room, but really, uh, you know, I, I think it does hit close to home. You know, a, a lot of us are checking the news every day and seeing different reports from different parts of the world about patients' experiences. Um, I wanna to relay to you uh, a couple of just hearsay reports that again, aren't peer reviewed, but have been published in credible news sources. There was one report from a neurosurgeon in China uh, this is in Wuhan. Uh, this was, I think, in December of this year, where during an endoscopic pituitary uh, surgery, all 14 patients or all 14 uh, uh, staff who were in the room at the time of surgery uh, became infected uh, with the, the new coronavirus. There are also reports coming out of Wuhan um, that was put on, on Bloomberg the other day that show that both ENTs and ophthalmologists uh, who succumb to the new coronavirus are overly representative of the healthcare workers who are infected. So this is reported in Bloomberg from Wuhan, but it's also been reported from patients in it or from, from healthcare workers in Italy. And so I think, I think this just tells us that it's, it's, we have a, 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 a vested interest as ophthalmologists about what's going on. And let's not forget uh, uh, the uh, uh, Lee, uh, 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 Wen Liang, the Chinese ophthalmologist who is 33 years old and who had a wife and a daughter at home, who is the whistleblower on uh, the novel coronavirus in China, also uh, contracted the disease and he ultimately passed from it. So, you know, I, I think this, this, this should really strike a chord with uh, most of the listeners here in the audience. So why is it that ENTs and ophthalmologists and endoscopic surgeries tend to have uh, potentially these higher risks associated with them? Uh, it may be that there's just a higher viral load in the upper respiratory system, that endoscopic sinus surgery using things like the mitre, microdebreeder uh, can aerosolize a significant amount, a significant amount of particles that then put the OR staff at risk. Okay, so quickly, uh, I wanna talk about things that we can use to protect ourselves. You know, we've all heard of the word PAPR at this point. We all are familiar with our N95s from our annual tuberculosis screening fittings. Um, but briefly, I wanna talk about the PAPR just to give people some background because in the next few slides, I will talk about uh, uh, PPE, what we need to use, when we need to use it. And I think it's important for us to know what we're talking about and define our terms. So first, PAPR, powered air purifying respirator. Here's a schematic. Essentially, you can see that there's a motorized unit that people carry at the hip. Uh, on that motorized unit, there's a filter paper that filters the particles as they come through the motor. The motor then pushes the air through the tubing and then into the mask that the, uh, the uh, user is wearing. That pressure uh, is uh, positive pressurized, meaning that there's, uh, uh, the pressure is pushed or circulated through the mask system and then pushed out underneath the shoulders of the mass system. And so the user is really only breathing the air that has been purified there. The PAPRs uh, are superior than the N95s in clearing aerosols from ambient air. And we know that when, when, you, when you look at these companies who make these products, 
uh, they describe these protective uh, equipment using uh, something called an APF or an assigned protection factor. And what that does is it tells you how effective that particular unit is, is at clearing out aerosols from the ambient environment. Uh, the APF is really a relative number between the number of particles in the ambient air uh, and the number of particles that, that get into the air that you're breathing with whatever unit you're using. Um, so if you've got 10 units of, uh, or if you have an APF of 10, uh, that means that you can expect to inhale uh, uh, no more than about one-tenth of whatever the aerosols are outside of whatever sort of respirator system you're using. So the N95 has an APF of 10. So you breathe in one-tenth of the aerosols that are in the ambient air on the outside of the N95. The PAPRs come in two, fines, uh, two kinds of loose fitting and a tight fitting. At Keck, we're only using the tight fitting, and you can see that as an APF of 1,000. So we're talking about a logarithmic increase in uh, the amount of protection you're getting from these environmental aerosols. Um, if you look at PAPR and you go to a website, uh, go to 3M websites, they come in lots of shapes and designs. Most of them look like uh, you're either uh, based off of a stormtrooper or based off of a, a Halloween ghost costume. Um, but we have these PAPRs here at Keck. This is one of our nurses who's modeling the units that we use here. It's a tight fitting model. You can see how it goes underneath the chin there. And then you can see here the battery pack there that's, a, that's attached to his hip. That supplies uh, the energy needed to push that air through his headpiece and give him the positive pressure and also uh, purify the air that he's breathing underneath that, uh, that, that, that headpiece. There are certainly some limitations to the PRPR that our providers are going to be using. First of all, they're fairly bulky. Uh, if you're using it in the operating room, it's easy to contaminate a sterile field. Um, they do fog easily on the inside, which is an issue because you're not able to clean that fog. Um, for, for providers like myself and Dr. Zhang, it makes it difficult because you're not able to use a headlight and there are certain times when you're working in the sinuses or working deep in the orbit that that is slightly less than ideal. Another big limitation is that it doesn't discharge, it doesn't filter the discharged air. So the provider who's using it is breathing in clean air, but if that provider happens to be infected or happens to be corona positive, there's nothing that's clearing those viral particles when it escapes or underneath the shoulder pad on his PAPR into the environment. And then finally, I think relevant to a lot of the listeners here is that it's unless you're fairly creative, I would imagine it's relatively difficult to use a PAPR use uh, with an ophthalmic microscope in the operating room. Um, <clears throat> this slide, I'm going to kind of blast through it, uh, just really talks about how we have known in the United States, as well as in Canada, and really across the world, that given a pandemic, we're going to be at significant shortage of supplies. And I just find it rather ironic that here we are in the middle of a pandemic. And again, the issue seems to be uh, supplies and reserves of these units. But here we are, so I think uh, it's important that we make do with what we have and try to make the best of the situation. If you look at the guidelines for different kinds of protective equipment that we should be using, you know, one of the first places I think a lot of us will look is the AAO website. They have a new COVID-19 resource center. You know, I've spent a significant amount of time over the past couple of days looking over that resource center. Most of it are, are links to the CDC website or links to other uh, surgical associations that have uh, strong recommendations. The AAO, as far as, uh, you know, PPE and patient encounters in the OR, doesn't really have a hard line. Really, the, the meat and potatoes is that they say in this last sentence, it's a rapidly evolving issue, and they will continue to update us as things evolve. And so really, the AAO has no hard line uh, uh, guidelines on the kinds of PPE that we should be using in particular patient encounters. So <clears throat> they've the certain, certain ophthalmic uh, groups or subspecialties have, have issued their own guidelines for their providers. I want to go briefly through some of these. Uh, the ASOPers, so our oculoplastic surgeons, we're going to do our best to avoid uh, those cases that have a high risk of viral aerosolization, namely those that involve the nasal and sinus mucosa. Uh, they do in, uh, encourage all of us to get uh, coronavirus testing prior to surgery. Um, as you'll see, they also, uh, like we have at the policy we have at the ASC right now, you know, only the, the anesthesiologists or the central personnel in the OR during intubation, extubation, these are the high risk times during the procedure. And then they also say that full PPE should be used for oral staff. However, they fail to define PPE in their recommendations. Uh, the American Association of Ophthalmic Oncologists and Pathologists also issued their own recommendations a few days ago. Uh, you know, they mentioned for their pathologist, it's the highest risk for us right now um, are going to be from those specimens that are, that are, are 
um, worked on during frozen section analysis. They also recommend PPE, but they define PPE in their recommendations as either as at minimum a surgical mask and eye protection and go so far as to say an N95 is ideal during these uh, uh, procedures in which you handle conjunctival, nasolacrimal, or sinus specimens. They go on to say that frozen specimens will be sent directly to the, the microbiology lab. Don't send them any place else where they then have to be processed to go to the micro lab, go there directly, and then place all permanent inspections and form immediately uh, during the case. The American College of Surgeons has put out their guidelines regarding uh, protective, uh, provider protective equipment and patient interactions. And um, <clears throat> they've done a good job, I think, of uh, uh, describing what kind of equipment needs to be worn during what kind of patient encounter. In the green, uh, you can see that, they, they, that the patients that you're undergoing a routine visit uh, with uh, patients who are COVID negative and are not under investigation, all you need is a surgical, a surgical mask. In the gold, uh, patients who are uh, under investigation or patients who have tested positive for coronavirus uh, who are not undergoing high-risk procedures, they encourage, uh, or they, they, they state that their guidelines are that you should be wearing eye protection um, or face shield as well as a surgical mask, a gown, and gloves. And then for those surgeries that have high risk of generating aerosols, uh, namely, I've, I've listed them there at the bottom, the laryngoscopy, intubation, uh, CPR, et cetera, they uh, state that the protective equipment that should be worn is either a PAPR, uh, like I mentioned earlier, or an N95 respirator with a face shield or eye protection uh, gown and gloves. So we can see here that they're really reserving the PAPR for those high-risk procedures in patients uh, who are either suspected of COVID or have uh, been, been uh, uh, documented as, as having coronavirus. Um, and then we can also see that the N95 face mask shield combination is essentially a, a poor man's PAPR if we can't get our hands on it. So we're taking a patient to the operating room. H how do we ensure everybody's safety? There, there are no guidelines right now that, that, that specifically outlay or outlay the, the protocol through which the patient goes into the OR, undergoes the operation, and then goes back to the floor. Um, one uh, 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 paper that was published uh, last week in um, that was published last week came out of Singapore, and uh, it's been cited on the AAO website. It's been cited by the American College of Physicians and Surgeons um, as being a great resource for uh, ambulatory surgery centers as well as hospital-based surgery centers. Um, and the reason why it's been uh, it's held in such high regard is that in Singapore, at least uh, up to three days ago. There had been no reports of healthcare workers becoming infected with coronavirus uh, due to their work or infected within the healthcare system. So, what do they do that makes their operating room procedures so effective on these coronavirus patients? Well, first of all, they use the same operating room with the same anesthesia machine for each case um, that are coronavirus positive. They use a negative pressure operating room with a known airflow pattern to ensure that they don't put personnel within the airflow pattern that's going to go out of the ventilators. The anesthesiologists drop all their drugs, uh, including syringes and needles, and lays them out on top of the drug trolley prior to the case so that they don't have to manipulate the drug trolley, so they don't have to open it uh, during the case so that fomites might then land there that could potentially uh, cause contact transmission at a later date. They use disposable airway equipment, and they always uh, secure the airway at the beginning of the case with a video-assisted laryngoscope, uh, if only because that gives them the highest uh, first chance success rate, and they'd rather not manipulate the airway as much as possible. Uh, if the patient's coming from the ICU, uh, for example, for a tracheostomy, all providers wear PPE. They didn't uh, clarify what kind of PPE that is there in this paper, um, but they have a transport ventilator. When the patient gets to the operating room, they turn off the gas flow on the, on the, uh, on the transport vent, they clamp the ET tube with the hemostat, and then they unclamp it after they switch ventilators. The anesthesia team wears PAPR uh, during uh, intubation, extubation, and everybody in the operating room uh, uses PAPR if they're doing anything involving uh, the airway where uh, those providers may be at high risk. They also wait for a minimum of one hour between cases to clean and decontaminate. Uh, apart from cleaning off uh, all hard surfaces, they also use a hydrogen peroxide, uh, peroxide vaporizer. If you're unclear what that is, here's a picture of it. It looks rather similar to R2-D2. Uh, you've got two machines. The first machine releases the aerosolized hydrogen peroxide into the air in the operating room. The 
takes about eight minutes and it's supposed to con uh, cover all the hard services. It lets the hydrogen peroxide sit there in the room for about 15 minutes. And then the second unit uh, then aerosolizes uh, another substance that then uh, stimulates a redox reaction to convert that H2O2 into uh, water and oxygen so that when the providers come back into the room, they don't have to uh, touch services that are covered with hydrogen peroxide just to, to, to prevent any sort of a, a toxic reaction to the providers. Um, and then finally, all staff uh, shower prior to going back to their regular duty. So all staff who are involved in the operating room must shower before they go back. Um, looking at our ENT colleagues, they have set up a similar protocol for patients going to the operating room. They also mandate that all patients uh, undergo uh, coronavirus testing. They also use operating rooms with negative pressures. Uh, they uh, they, they clearly delineate high-risk procedures, and uh, for those undergoing those high-risk procedures, they, every, every provider wears the maximum amount of PPE possible as they can. If they have access to PAPR, they do that, um, regardless of the patient's coronavirus status, because it may be that the, they have a false negative with the coronavirus that they didn't test at the appropriate time. And so they're just ensuring the, the adequate safety of all providers, and, and really, why not? Because when you're dealing with the disease right now that, that, that is apparently so, uh, uh, um, where the infectivity seems to be coming from all directions, they're really trying to maximize their own security. Busy slide here. I'll talk about just a couple of points. Uh, this is again from those ENT guidelines. They break down patient encounters into uh, uh, non-procedural encounters, into procedural encounters uh, where there are no aerosols generated, and then finally, uh, procedural encounters that do generate aerosols. And in each one of those three subsets, they give a list of recommendations for the kind of provider uh, protective equipment used based on the risk of uh, whatever sort of procedure or, or exam they're doing. Um, <clears throat> I want to point out that there's really only one subset of, uh, well, first of all, uh, I, I want to point out that for any encounter or procedure that's high risk to the clinician, they always encourage the use of an N95 mask. But I also want to point out that only during those aerosol generating procedures do they encourage the use of the PAPR. And so I, I think what a lot of our national societies are doing right now is really trying to, to maximize the resources where we really need them and not use the PAPR unnecessarily. So if, if you had you know, um, fallen asleep during my talk so far, uh, if you were eating breakfast or getting your morning cup of coffee, uh, that's, that's, that's okay by me at this point, but I, I just ask that you kind of plug in for the next few slides because I think this is gonna be the most relevant to everybody here during the lecture. We'll go over the current get, get guidelines, both with ASC and the main OR to talk about how we're triaging these patients. So first of all, what do you do if one of your patients who say needs an emergent tube, who needs emergent PKP is coronavirus positive? Well, all of those patients right now are going to the main OR. If it's a high risk procedure of generating aerosols, uh, which I imagine that most people here won't be doing uh, apart from Dr. Zhang and I, um, if it is that high risk, it's gonna go to OR3 because there's a negative pressure there, uh, OR at the main OR. For all other cases, they're gonna to go to ORs 20 to 25 as those are the dedicated ORs to our coronavirus patients here at Keck right now. What's the screening policy? Well, currently, and this is again, as of this morning, we're only using a questionnaire asking patients about symptoms, about exposure, about recent fevers. Um, this is done three times uh, at the, by the surgical coordinator, uh, by the OR nurse the night before, and then at the front desk the day of surgery. The exception is the ENT is actively at, at the moment testing four days prior to all their procedures. In the future, there is gonna be on-site testing. I know a lot of you got this email yesterday that talks about the, uh, the case flow. What we're, and this is, I, I was on the phone with Leah earlier this morning. Um, what Keck and what uh, both the main OR and the ASC are gonna be moving to is on-site testing four days prior um, to all surgical cases. It doesn't matter if it's high risk or not, it's all surgical cases. Um, we're gonna have our own sites for the patients. They're gonna be medical tents set up over where the farmer's market is uh, behind the cafeteria where patients will be tested and screened uh, again four days prior. The results have to come back uh, within the patient's chart prior to letting them operate or prior to letting them go into the ASC uh, for surgery. 
This is all dependent upon when we get those surgical test kits, which according to Leia should be any time now. But currently as of today, we're still only using the questionnaire form. So what are we doing with intubation and extubation? Uh, the, the, there's gonna be a dedicated anesthesia team wearing PAPR and uh, an N95. If you're not wearing an N95, N95 during the case, you have to wait 30 minutes uh, before, or 30 minutes after the intubation before entering the operating room. Uh, and this just allows all the air that was there during the intubation to be cleared from the operating room. So key point is here, if you have a surgery, don't forget your N95, otherwise they're gonna ice you for 30 minutes before you go in and uh, operate. How do we clean the ore between cases? Unfortunately, we don't have the hydrogen peroxide uh, aerosolizers here. They're just doing a terminal clean similar to the TB protocol. I talked with uh, Dr. Michael Kim, the head anesthesiologist over at the uh, main Keck OR yesterday about the protocol. And my question is, you know, do you have any guidelines in place for uh, procedures that are high risk in patients who are uh, SARS, who, are, who, are, who have tested negative uh, for the coronavirus? In, in, in Keck itself doesn't. You know, I mentioned the ENT guidelines earlier that does. They say that they treat all those as if they're infected, but Keck doesn't have that kind of policy in place right now. And then finally, out of my own curiosity, uh, I asked him if he was going to, if they were planning on making all the providers shower after these procedures. And um, it sounds like he was either blowing me off or, or that might actually be a scenario later on down the road and we, we might need to bring our shower, shower shoes to work. Um, so this is uh, given to me again yesterday by Dr. Michael Kim. Uh, this just goes through uh, the, the high risk procedures um, that they consider over there at the, at the main OR for patients who have tested positive for COVID or at least under, under investigation for having coronavirus. And you'll note that ophthalmology at this time is considered uh, uh, high risk and you need to use PAPR for those uh, cases. And, and once again, you know, this is a question I brought up with Dr. Kim yesterday. Well, uh, if you have a, a case where you need intraocular surgery, it really doesn't make sense from a functional standpoint to use those PAPR units with an ophthalmic microscope. And he mentioned to me that what a lot of the ENT doctors who are using microscopes now are doing is they'll use the PAPR during uh, uh, other portions of the case. And when they need to move to the microscope, they'll just switch over to the face shield um, or, or, or eye goggles with an N95. And so it seems like that's an, an, an acceptable alternative over there at the Keck main operating room. Um, again, busy slide here, and this is, uh, 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 really just to show us um, that high-risk surgery, of which ophthalmology is considered one, really needs the N95. So out of interest of time, I'm going to kind of blow through the next three slides. We can get Dr. Zhang uh, 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 chatting about her thoughts. Uh, essentially, this is about the N95s that we're using right now, the different kinds of use uh, patterns we can use, the extended use and the reuse. Uh, you know, uh, I'll give you the quick uh, Cliff's notes really just do your best not to touch the face mask, especially if you're gonna use it for an extended period of time or if you're gonna reuse it. Um, you, you really, uh, there was one study that showed that, that healthcare providers over an eight, eight hour shift uh, wearing an N95 touched their face mask uh, at, uh, up to 25 times during that shift. And so we're really just encouraging people, if you're wearing the N95 to, to make it effective, it can also be uh, a vector for contact transmission and do your best not to touch the surgical mask. Blow through these. Uh, f finally, um, you know, what can we do after our cases when we go home to ensure that we're not going to transmit this to our family? Uh, you know, keeping hand sanitizer on hand after you use things that are communally touched, like ATMs, vending machines, gasoline pumps. You know, clean your hands, clean those surfaces, clean your cell phone frequently. Uh, one suggestion given by the American College of Surgeons is that when you get home, you take off your scrubs that were used during the case, you put them in a garbage bag, and then you also shower at home um, and then wash those clothes immediately just so you try to reduce the contract transmissions in your house. And then finally, and this was put there on, on um, um, the American College of Physicians and Surgeons website, is that if you think that your family is too high risk or you might have a person at home or multiple people at home who are too high, uh, are considered high risk and you really don't want to uh, bring something home from them from your environment, it's not out of the realm of reasonability to ask your hospital or institution to put you up in a hotel room for a brief period of time. Um, if you wanted to bring that up, you've got leverage from their website that says it's a viable alternative. Next couple slides are going to be a segue into Dr. Zhang's discussion. You know, here we look at the PPE that's provided by people in China versus those uh, sort of in the Western countries. Uh, this is just 
uh, sort of a, a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek mockery of, of the kind of, a, of, of the, the <laughs> vision we're dealing with right now. Um, second slide that Dr. Zhang is also going to mention is that we really don't know what the sensitivity and specificity of these uh, coronavirus testing uh, protocols are. You know, the CDC says that they're similar to influenza testing, which runs about 90 to 95% sensitivity. This one test published uh, last week on the 25th shows that there's only an 83% sensitivity just from the PCR alone. Um, and then finally, something that hits a little close to home is that, uh, you know, I think some of you may remember uh, from, from uh, a few years ago, uh, the former Cornea fellow, Habib Ahmad, if you, if you get on the Washington Post, there's a, a touching video uh, given by his family uh, about the his fight right now in a in a in a New York ICU as he as he's struggling to to, to fight the coronavirus. So at that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Zhang and let her let her run away with it. Yes, um, thank you. You can actually leave it back up. Go back to the uh, the Chinese PPE slide. I think it. First of all, Eric, thank you for summarizing a lot of the literature that we have. And as we know, we don't have a lot of literature um, with this current pandemic because it's quickly evolving and, um, and we've had to rely on some uh, alternate sources for quick publication and dissemination of information. Um, so we always uh, want to make sure that we're looking at the sources to um, uh, make sure that we are looking at reliable uh, data. Um, but one actually interesting uh, perspective is that this, um, when China sent uh, about 42,000 healthcare workers to Wuhan to help because their actual healthcare workers were dying, as, as you mentioned, Li Wen Liang uh, passed, or the ophthalmologist passed away, but they had a lot of healthcare workers die initially in the pandemic because of in a, um, inadequate PPE. So the people that they did send were covered with um, double covered their heads, their feet, their hands, um, sealed eye protection. And uh, according to the Chinese government, they uh, said that none of those 42,000 healthcare workers became infected um, who were sent to Wuhan. And now they're, uh, the teams are coming back. So it is interesting. And, and, and China's in a place where they actually have a lot of PPE. They've been, they, they're the main producers of it in the world. So they had the luxury of having a lot of PPE so they could really kind of overprotect their healthcare workers. Um, and, and unfortunately right now, the rest of the world, we're not at that point yet where that we can um, do that. So we have to ration our PPE, um, which is why none of the societies can mention, oh, let's go full blown Wuhan like the, the people did in China. Um, so we, but we do have to keep in perspective that we have colleagues who, um, have been exposed, um, even in New York. I, I don't know if any of you guys know um, Dr. Uh, Ahmad, but he is, they, they, his family made a plea for his um, care because they're having trouble giving remdesivir, they're having, um, and um, in the plasma trials, we don't know if he's um, able to get that. So um, they, we have uh, colleagues who do what we do every day who are still getting infected. So really studying how to protect ourselves and our patients is really important. Um, and I wanted to open up for a discussion because I'm sure there's probably some questions. Oh, one, uh, one other point is um, I was speaking with the hospital epidemiology who spoke to us a few weeks ago, Dr. Neha Nanda, and they are making uh, policies uh, regarding specific surgical procedures now. So she last night she just asked me for what our ACE operas guidelines were that were presented. So they are coming up with a more detailed hospital policy of how to manage our high risk surgeries. Um, so that is coming down the pike. They're working on it. And, I, and our hospital, she does tell me, does need PPE. So if people have good contacts for PPE, they do welcome that information. Reliable. Any other questions from people? Um, any um, news on county policies for OR? You know, that's they're probably going to mirror each other, but um, I, I, we did not speak directly to the county supervisor, uh, the county um, policymakers. 
um, but they, our policies tend to mirror each other. So if, if any of you guys have information on that, please share. I know they stopped all emergent and urgent surgeries as well. What, what, has anybody gone to the OR yet um, for an urgent case at county? Glaucoma service has, I don't know if they can comment. Yeah, I was, uh, this is Grace Stricter. I was in the OR yesterday with um, Justin Dredge, our fellow. We've had like three cases each week, the last couple of weeks. And the new policy as of this week was that the only um, surgeons allowed in the room are the actual operating surgeon and the attending surgeon. So for the cases that I staff, um, you know, Megan, our senior resident, couldn't be there um, just to reduce exposure. But besides that, I mean, for our cases, which don't require intubation, um, nothing had really changed otherwise in terms of the protocol. Okay, so everybody wore, did, did they have COVID testing? Because for cat? I don't think yeah. so. I, I don't know if Justin's there or Megan, if they can comment, but I don't think they are doing COVID testing yet routinely. So um, this is Sagar, Brett and Fellow. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So they told us, uh, Dr. Andrews mentioned that he wanted us to ask the patients 48 hours before if they have any symptoms. Um, and documented in the chart, they're definitely not doing any COVID testing. I haven't heard that they're planning on it, but um, that's what we're supposed to do, at least ask them before, and then in the H&P the day of, talk to them about it again, um, and then proceed. Um, and just to re-echo that, um, uh, Dr. Wong is uh, just reiterating, it needs to be the surgeon um, themselves calling and talking to the patient about symptoms, but they aren't prophylactically testing it. Any, like at CHLA, they, um, uh, every single patient preoperatively gets tested, um, but county currently is not doing that. Yeah, so the, the Keck policy is uh, now, I mean, everything is evolving, and I think it may involve at county too, um, is that the patients have to be tested for COVID-19 now uh, prior. Um, so for example, I have a case coming up for an orbital biopsy that we tested, um, and he's negative. And because he's negative, um, we don't need to wear PAPR in the operating room, but they do still recommend an N95 and um, eye goggles or a face shield uh, mm -hmm. during the case uh, for my upcoming case. And then for, and, but that one is just probably a lateral orbitotomy. I'm not going into the sinus mucosa. So <clears throat> even though we have to use power tools to take off the bone, we don't have any research. We don't have any data that says the the virus is in the bone, as far as we know. Um, although orthopedists may argue something differently, but to be extra safe, they still want us to wear the N95s and the um, goggles. Now, for the um, the going back to the patient that um, Eric first presented in the beginning, um, with that orbital decompression, we're going to have to go into the sinus um, to adequately decompress him. So uh, we will probably. Um, request to wear PAPRs uh, for that uh, procedure, uh, whether or not um, the COVID-19 test comes back positive or not. The, if it comes back positive, then basically the utility of that, um, at least for ENTs, is that they may see if they can wait another two weeks and make sure it's that they're, they have the least amount of viral load during surgery. Uh, but if, but they will still, because of the uh, sensitivity, as you saw, even in patients with pneumonia who uh, had CT findings that were very convincing for COVID-19, only 83% of those PCRs even picked up people who were that sick. So you can imagine um, in asymptomatic people or pre-symptomatic people that the, the sensitivity of the, the test is actually not that great uh, either. So they are basically treating everybody as a potential uh, COVID-19 patient. At least that's what the ENT service um, does. And, and, I, and any surgeries that are high risk should have the patient still treated as a potential COVID-19 patient due to the nature of this virus. So I think that's important information to share. Um, and the question- hey, Eric. Go ahead. Eric and Sandy, uh, this is Martin. Uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, putting together a pretty, uh, very comprehensive talk. Do we know what the um, negative predictive value is for the, uh, the 
the viral test because that's really what we want to know, right? I mean, you want to see you know, what the rate of false negative is, which is what's kind of which is what we're concerned about. Yeah, there. You know, we were looking for studies um, that would describe that, and um, there's not a lot, surprisingly, um, that are validated. Uh, the the uh, for that. I mean, it, it's just looking for sensitivity. I found that one paper. Um, so uh, predict, the negative predictive value um, is is something that yeah we all want to know. And then now with the new antibody tests that are faster. I think it'll be very helpful that when we get those um, more widely distributed that we as healthcare workers check to see if we've got been exposed and if we have and we have positive antibodies and we didn't have to go through anything great. Um, and then we should be safe to uh, be back at work without as, as much concern, you know. I heard some uh, ED physicians anecdotally mainly going just straight to chest CT that that is the their most sensitive means for yeah yeah that paper showed that was ninety seven percent predictive versus the actual PCR test yeah is there any push to like have ever you know getting I know that would potentially have a lot of false positives. Um, but is there any looking into getting that as a type of screening, like a CT chest prior uh, uh, preoperatively? No, I mean, I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask uh, Neha Nanda, since she just asked me about some other stuff, I'll see where they're at with, um, with that, because yeah. kind of did convert to that. Uh, Hi, most, uh, this is Mike Bernstein, most radiology departments are pushing back that they do not want to get chest, routine chest CTs because it exposes every other patient that comes into the CT scanner. Oh, so yeah. they're advising not to do that for either diagnosis or pre-surgical evaluation. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, and it's also a lot of radiation for people who we may. So, I mean, if we're in a, at a point where they're getting it anyway, um, then we could rely on the chest CT results more than their um, COVID-19 test. But yeah, doing it routine, pre-op. Pre so this is already a big step for them to be doing it pre-op for every surgical patient now, because clearly county has not converted to that yet. Um, and I think it's a it's an availability of resources. Once there are the resources, if we had unlimited resources, those are the things we, we we would dress like that guy, the guy on the left. We would, you know, we would test everybody. If we had those resources, that's what we would do. But right now, this is what we have to uh, work with. I want to make a comment here in that um, I think our most effective tool uh, in the fight against the uh, coronavirus is still social distancing. Yes. So please what we're keep doing that now. in mind. That's why Absolutely. we're zooming. Yeah, thank you for setting this up and leading us through that, uh, Martin and nursing. So, and then uh, the eye protection. Um, we we have goggles in clinic, but apparently the uh, the OR has sealed eye goggles available. So you can request um, the sealed eye goggles if you have a case that you're worried about aerosolization. Um, and the question is whether mucosal surgery, conjunctival surgery um, is aerosolizing. We don't have data on that. Uh, yeah, that is a, we think if, if, you know, especially if the patient had conjunctivitis, there's always a chance that it's in the mucosa there. But um, so I would just um, be cautious. All right, any other questions? I think this is a really important topic to be discussing. We are way over time. <laughs> okay, and if so, if there's no further questions, oh, oh, Eric, one more thing. Can you go back to the last slide with the protocol that that we're using now? Yeah, and if anybody you know want, can help out. Um, Dr. Ahmad's family, uh, they are really looking for people with connections to, to try to get remdesivir and, um, um, and, and plasma donors um, that I think they're, they're really desperate to help him to help get him off the vent. 
Um, so the at the at in, in the end is we want to focus that there are the regardless of the COVID nineteen re test results the staff are still following COVID nineteen precautions whether they're testing positive or negative so that's what we're doing here at Keck and I think that's a good idea. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank um, you. Yeah.